Hey, what's happening around here? <coughs> Sorry, can't breathe. I'm Captain Tommy Scoville, and you're on the lifeboat. What's happening? Unfortunately, I was glued to a computer all day, and I missed the eclipse. I'm sorry, queen of awkwardness. Um, I've been accused of being late. I'm not late. I'm not late. I'm not late. I'm not late. Uh, I got a 60 seconds from the time that this thing uh, starts. I'm not late. Uh, but in case you thought I was, I'm not late. Valerie102, good to see you. Deeming, what's happening? Jason P. Jason P. Good to see you. SB, what's happening? Clarissa, or is that Clarissa? Clarissa, Clarissa. It was too cloudy in Winnipeg, Canada. Plant Freak, what's happening? Hey, Relatable Reese is in the house. Inappropriate Heifers here. Hey, Hef, what's happening? Zelda, good to see you. Tara Smiling. Hello, how are you? Kristen Melinda, good to see you. Elizabeth Gundy, how are you? Packer girl. Hey, Seventh, how are you? Hey, Betsy. Listen, uh, people, stop by and see uh, Tara Smiling. She was doing a, uh, a show. I stopped by and checked it out. The girl's got a voice. Absolutely worth, the young woman has a voice. Absolutely worth going and listening to. I think, uh, I think you're going to dig it. If you haven't stopped by, maybe somebody with a wrench can toss uh, her name up there. That would be great. Valerie 102 is in the hizzy, and so is Anne Hummingbird. Layla, got me on the knees. Scooby, Scooby Lee, Jen Marie. Jen Marie says, thanks again to all who joined me earlier. I'll throw up uh, Jen Marie's link as well. Seventh says, I missed the uh, eclipse too. I fell asleep. I don't know that you missed a whole lot. Seventh, you know what? The term total eclipse of the sun doesn't mean the same thing everywhere. Apparently, apparently there's only going to be, hey, Tampa Bay, apparently there was only going to be a small amount of the, the sun. That, and I noticed that. I mean, it got cooler outside of that. And the, it was like a, a partial shade. It was, the, but I guess in other parts of the world it might have been more extreme. Here you notice it because it's always really hot. Hey, Rob McMullen, good to see you, Rob. How are you? Decibel chaos. Good to see you, Shauna. What's happening? Do 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 do. Yarn prepper. Rick Spicer, it is good to see you. Your aunt got good pictures of it. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Body illusion, welcome. Misa smokes. L K F. That only took six months to learn. Lord Kids Freak, what's happening? Sorita. Hi, Heather. Hey, Tommy and all boaters. We had a total eclipse in the Wak in the Waxachi. Even confused our chickens for a uh, a few minutes. Nice. I always love it when you say this, my brother. It is always a pleasure to see all of you in here. We're going to talk about something serious. Been a while since I did that, huh? You know what? We are the biggest consumers on planet Earth. We being the good old United States of America. I know we've got friends. I can see right now four countries. Uh, three other than us that I know for sure. Oh, nope, four other than us that I know for sure. Jen Marie says 98% totality in Detroit. That's 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 your damn near total, right? I don't know that it gets more than that, does it? Uh, Rexkin Messler said partial in, uh, in um, Montana. Montana, yeah, that would have to be Montana, I think. Hello, Matrix Rabbit. Hey, there she is. What's happening, Miss Dragon? Miss Dragon, your gray pussycat looks so much like Spanx Calhoun's first cat. It's incredible. Except Spanx Calhoun's cat was two and a half times the size of your gray kitty. But they look so much, oh, Minnesota, that's better. They look so much the same through the face. It's just incredible. I, I watched that short of yours where the kitty is on top of the um, washing machine of the, the, um, or the dryer meowing with the, uh, the harness on that. I watched that video about a hundred times because it reminded me so much of uh, Spanky's, uh, uh, Spanky's cat. All right. So <clears throat> why is it that we do more dope 
than any other place. Why is that? Why do you think it is that, um, do you think there's a correlation between having a lot of cash, having opulence, having a, a, a higher quality of life than most of the world? Say what you will, America's not hurting when you compare it to a lot of other places. So if all of the needs are being met, right? If we have enough food, if we have shelter, if we have all of these things that we need, right? And they're, and they're there and they're easy, then why is it that we're all getting loaded? Do you wonder why is it that we do so much dope? And I want to tell you something. Am I, uh, am I in your way, cat? Is there something you'd like to look at? Boy, is she a weird one. I'm telling you, she's doing this number, right? The, uh, why is it that we do dope in, in quantities that we do? First of all, let me tell you something, any statistics that you're going to hear on dope in the U S and they are off the chain that the numbers are s staggering. 56 million people admit to using drugs recreationally. That's one of the newest things that uh, they're out with. If, if by some chance you believe that, right? There's 300 million people in this country. If you take into account the number of people who are elderly, if you take into account the number of people that are, uh, you know, that are children, you're talking about a really large chunk of money. And I'll tell, I mean, uh, of people rather that <clears throat> a massive chunk of people that are getting high. And those statistics are lies. I promise you, the average drug user isn't copping to doing drugs. The average drug user isn't saying, oh, yeah, no, I, I recreationally abuse this, this, and this. There is a percentage of the, uh, of the population that are going to admit to it. But I promise you, the number is probably in the 80%. And when you throw booze into, into the mix, right, people who drink, that is a, absolutely a drug. By the time you've taken it all and put it into account, Everybody in this country is on something, right? Now put in, um, like our friend said the other day, how about psychotropics? If you're taking something like a uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, right? If you're taking a, uh, a tricyclic antidepressant, are you on a mind-altering substance? And if you are, then what percentage of this world isn't taking something? Well, what percentage of this country isn't taking something? Nobody in this country isn't, is, you know, there are so few people. Statistically speaking, if you go back to the 70s, the average person in the U.S. would have one to two prescriptions written for them per year. Now the average American has over six. That, that's a little frightening. It probably has something to do with the fact that they advertise drugs on the television all the friggin' time, right? They advertise drugs that you can't buy. A doctor has to write you a prescription for it, yet they are going to, hey, Julie, Phil, what's happening? Yet they're going to write you a prescription for it, Right? You're going to go into a doctor's office and instead of saying, oh, my back hurts. And, you know, you go in and you go, hey, here's what I want. And you got a whole list of stuff. My legs have been doing this one and bouncing up and down. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I got that uh, that restless leg stuff. Well, so give me that. Uh, what is it called? Lyrica. Write me a prescription for Lyrica. By the way, I don't get, uh, you know, like the old days. So why don't you write me a prescription for um, Viagra or what's the new one called? Cialis, right? Give me that time release Cialis stuff. Oh, there was one other drug. What was it? What's that one that's going to help me go to sleep? But I don't want my body to go to sleep. I just want my brain to go to sleep, right? That What's that cool one with the butterfly? Lunesta, right? That's the one, Lunesta. Now, by the time you leave the doctor's office, you've requested three freaking drugs. Do you know that those are the drugs you should be having? You realize what this has done to the doctor-patient relationship, right? It has bent it over to Coleman. That's what it's done to it, right? It has absolutely put it into a place. <laughs> it absolutely is putting it into a place where so much damage has been done. Most of us don't try to trust doctors anymore. When you go in there and the doctor goes, listen, uh, I want you to look something up online when you leave here. He gets out that notepad and he writes on it. You get in the car, you take the notepad out. It's got the name of a drug on the top of it, right? Because some really, really attractive drug uh, representative, a pharmaceutical rep, just dropped off a bunch of those pads and bags of samples of drugs. No joke. Sample drugs. So the guys you wanted to be friends with were like orthopedic doctors, you know, people that dealt with people that had injuries that, you know, that, that hurt. Guys that had torn knees, whatever. Those people were pain specialists. They would get samples. 
two Vicoprofens in a little plastic packet. We had a doctor we used to ski with. And he would say to me, hey, you know, the uh, the woman came by and brought those uh, Vicoprofens again. You know, you want some of them? And there'd be two of them to a packet, right? Now, they were fives. So I would have to take like 16 to 18 of these to catch a buzz. And I'd be sitting there opening these things, right? One right after the other. But the amount of money that the pharmaceutical companies spread around so the doctors will write scripts for this crap. You got doctors pushing one drug. You got patients demanding drugs, right? And now we can get on here. Uh -huh. I talked about this on this morning's boat, right? Be careful. Be careful you start going down the rabbit holes and deciding what's wrong with you. It's a, it's a scary thing because nowadays you start to think something's wrong with you and you go, you know, at night, I kind of like, I don't know, I'm weird in bed. You know, before I fall asleep, I bounce my leg a lot. Maybe I have restless leg, leg syndrome. And then you start Googling that crap. And before you know it, you got le restless leg syndrome and five other really rowdy uh, illnesses. But don't trip because late night TV is going to tell you every single drug that you need, right, to fix that problem. By the way, do you know how those laws work? This is great. They have to list X number of side effects. They don't have to list all of them. They have to list X number of side effects. Listen to the ones they list and realize that they had a choice in picking side effects. They didn't have to list all of them. You hear some of them, you're like, damn, man, you didn't, you didn't pick the, uh, you picked the pretty rugged ones. How bad were the ones you left off the list? Huh? Oh, that's a very cool toy though. One of my favorite toys was from a drug rep, a clear human statue where you could see the organs. Mom was an RN. Now that's a score right there, Miss Dragon. That's a score. Uh, but they do throw money around, don't they? And from Massachusetts says, laugh out loud. My doctor won't give me anything for my insomnia or anxiety. She said that since I have adverse reactions to NyQuil, Benadryl, and weed, I probably have bad reactions to those meds. You know what, Anne? Um, she might be right. You may be right. I may be crazy, uh, but it just may be a lunatic you're looking for. But there is a chance that they're right. Honestly, you had a bad reaction to Benadryl is diphenhydramine, right? Very few people have a bad reaction to, but NyQuil is also diphenhydramine. I don't know. Doctor might be an idiot. NyQuil and Benadryl um, are the same drug, the same active ingredient. And if you had an adverse reaction to weed, a lot of people have an adverse reaction to weed. Um, I don't know. Maybe try it down the doctor. <laughs> but you're better off not going down the big pharma road. That I believe. Big Pharma are so popular in the U.S. Medicaid, uh, medical care is so expensive too. In Europe, drugs aren't as expensive and Big Pharma isn't as popular. Um, you know, the, the thing is, the amount of money that gets thrown around in our country, right? This is, I don't know, the fifth, uh, you know, about 20% of our economy. You know, it's a big, big market. Now, not as big as the illicit market, not as big as the drugs coming across the border now. That's actually bigger than Big Pharma. Huh? Yeah, the fake perk 30s. Yeah, that's that's bigger business than the real ones. You know what? Those strawberry protein balls are the business. Here, try those things in milk in the morning. Put an ounce of them, right? Like one ounce of it in there and do it in the morning like cereal. That's what I do. Eat one ounce of those in the morning. That's uh, 30 grams of protein. And it's like 120 calories or something. And that's how you start the day. And you just don't get hungry. Protein is a beautiful way of getting that completely mellowed out. You know, the, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, um, they make a tremendous amount of money off of the, uh, so recouping the research and development that goes into the drugs, right? This is the period of time that drug uh, manufacturing companies are allowed to recoup their investments, right? They're allowed to uh, to get back however much money it took to research Viagra, right? Or whatever. But we know that this is a filthy, dirty, um, 
we know that this is a filthy, dirty system. We know that this is a system that, um, you know, Mary Gonzalez says today, I avoid stress and negativity as a way to, uh, to treat my, um, my anxiety. Excellent. Uh, that is a pretty good, uh, that is a pretty good thing. Um, and it's what everybody ought to be striving for. Big Pharma isn't, isn't, uh, isn't your friend, sadly. It really isn't. As they're trying to recoup all of this money and they're doing this, um, this stuff with, uh, uh, you know, with generic versus uh, name brand. We've talked about the Sacklers and the side little hustle piece that they did. They were allowed to run OxyContin for a really long time without anybody else competing with them so that they could recoup all of the research and development that went into Oxycontin, right? Development. They didn't have to develop anything. That It is complete and utter BS. Nobody on earth has to, can believe that line. You see, Contin, which is the, the technology, the time release is something called Contin, and they put it on the outside of morphine right ms cotton morphine sulfate contin time released morphine sulfate it was given to people who were dying it was given to them in hospice did a little hit the streets yeah people smuggled a little to the streets i did some morphine sulfate content it was excellent i mean from a drug standpoint it was excellent. i got a lot of punch, right and it lasted a very long time then oxycontin came next but all they did was take percodan right and then put the time release over it. But it's the same time release. You don't need to do research and develop anything. You're taking a drug that's been around, a painkiller that's been around since 1906 or something, and just wrapping it with something you developed on the last drug. That's just a hustle. But they were getting $50 a pill. And it was the most prescribed pill in America. Billions of dollars. The docs unloading Oxycontin, those things were going around the clock. 24 hours a day, trucks pulling out with pills. The pill mills around the country were cranking it. Anita Card, you are a card. You make me laugh. Um, your significant another met a local radio personality today. Well, that's always fun, isn't it, Scope? Good times. Where do you go to buy the protein balls? You can just go um, to the drop down deal here and uh, there's a link in it right there just click to that link and you know what i'd recommend the watermelon ones those are my favorites absolutely my favorites um nice well yeah here's the thing there's enough blame to go around my brother there's enough blame to go around absolutely teva uh, pharma in uh, in israel is huge um Palm Fret Pharmaceutical, there were, there were uh, Johnson & Johnson, the number of companies that were uh, producing this, um, you know, everybody, everybody was making a piece of this. And everybody, everybody knew how addicting this dope was. Make no mistake. Everybody. Now, there were some, um, you know what, Franklin? Yes and no. I mean, sure. We've we've had uh, we've had problems, right? With um, you know, since the since opium started to be uh, to be refined, we've had issues with it, right? The pop the 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 morphine molecule and the sap of the poppy has been an issue, and wars have been fought and everything. But we, right, as a, as a drug culture, this stuff was dead. This stuff was dead after the seventies. It had reached an all time low right? The amount of people that were addicted to opiates in this country were minuscule. I'm not saying we had eliminated it because we're never going to eliminate it, but it was big time low. But once those things started to become, yeah, yeah, it got refined. Bear, right? The people who brought you Bear Aspirin, now owned by Monsanto. If they weren't evil enough, they got the, uh, the people who brought you heroin are now partners with Monsanto. But, uh, and they're now under the bear Monsanto name or some such, but, uh, the, uh, that poison, right. That, that heroin, all of that, uh, all of that stuff, the, uh, we had gotten to a point after Vietnam, we had the first opioid crisis in the U S close to 4,000 people overdosed in a year. And we were up in arms about it, right now we lose that 
you know, a month. Actually, we lose considerably more than that a month, right? We're probably losing that a week, but we're accustomed to it now, aren't we? Right now, it's completely different. The Sacklers, I promise you, uh, the Sacklers brought you round two with help from a bunch of government uh, agencies, alphabet agencies. Don't get it messed up, people. Put on your tinfoil hats. Tommy's going surfing. You ready? Ah, we went to Vietnam, right? We were over there in that little uh, uh, area in uh, Southeast Asia that was rampant and thick with heroin. And when we came back, so did the heroin. Odd, right? Well, there's a lot of stories about allegedly, apparently, a lot of stories about these three-letter agencies that were funding a lot of that war by maybe slinging a little dope on the sides, right? And a lot of that heroin found its way onto the streets in New York City and in L.A. and in Chicago and in Miami. And we had a lot of deaths. It was a big deal. It was a very big deal. And then it kind of fizzled out a little, really. Why? Well, because we went to war in a different part of the world. See, we went down to South America. And they had cocaine. They weren't really cranking out a bunch of smack in that part of the world. So what did we do? Well, we created crack. A three-letter agency, right? Worked with some dude named Freeway Ricky Ross. And, uh, and the next thing you knew, we were at, the crack wars were going on. Yeah. That's how it happened. Oh, you absolutely can write them. You absolutely can write them. The only thing you need to have is their their uh, register number, their inmate number. Not hard to look up. And you write them that, not only are they going to get it, trust and believe they're going to read it. How's that? I promise you they're going to read it. They got a lot of time to kill. They got a lot of time to kill. And that is a lifeline to the outside. If you've never served time, then you can't imagine what it's like for there to be a conduit between you and that outside world. Right? That little, that little tube, that little conduit, that little anything that ties you to the real world. Because without it, people completely will, oh, they become, they become true inmates. They become institutionalized, All right? It's pretty ugly stuff. I remember, I've told the story on the boat before, but I had an inmate. I'll tell you his name. His name was Donald Scott Taylor. I can tell you his name because he's dead. He was um, killed in a, uh, in a cell in Victorville, California. Um, but, uh, that, uh, yeah, no, do write them a letter. They've got, they have nothing but time. I'm not going to tell you about that. It's, it's really kind of a sad story, <laughs> but he, he, this is the bottom line. The bottom line was the guy shot somebody when he was 29. He was not the guy he shot. The guy he shot was in his seventies, but he got life in federal prison for this murder. It was pretty heinous, but he got life in federal prison for it. And he said to me, uh, he, he said, boy, I could hear you dreaming. You know, you were making a lot of noise. I guess I was, you know, threatening somebody in my uh, in my sleep or something. And he said, what were you dreaming about? I said, oh, man, this guy that I knew on the streets owed me money. And I was chasing him down. I'm telling him the whole story, right? And I said, I was, I was out behind a 7-Eleven. And he goes, oh, you were dreaming about the street? I said, yeah, dude. I was, you know, I don't dream about prison. I go, you don't dream about the street? And he said, no, it's been years. If you don't have a conduit to the outside, then that world becomes fake. That outside world, it isn't real anymore. Talking to your family, writing letters to your family, you know, catching snippets of television. We were in a lockdown unit. There was no TV. There was no, there was nothing to tie you to the outside world by design, by design. It breaks your spirit quick as hell. I'll tell you what, man. I mean, that's why we were sent there. It was a special management unit. They take the worst of the worst and send them there and turn them into docile, uh, docile, well-behaved inmates, right? Uh, <laughs> for real, that's the uh, that's the idea. All the clockwork orange without all of the uh, the holding your eyelids open. But uh, same principle: beat the snot out of you until you agree to uh, to be a really good inmate. Yeah. Not sure how it worked, but. I walk along the avenue. Do, 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 do. 
You know what, Allison? I don't think I could watch this show without the live chat. Well, it might be hard because of, you know, I, I kind of got a, I got a gig I got to do on this side. Uh, will the American government ever take on the powerful Big Pharma? Well, here's the problem, Layla. That Big Pharma might just be our government, right? I don't know. I'm not trying to get too political or bum anybody out, but I, I don't, I'm to the point now where I believe that large, uh, that large corporations are running this country. So that's that's kind of where I am on that one. Uh, the government doesn't have any desire to uh, to fight big pharma, and the reason they don't is because there is a bunch of money being donated to both sides of the uh, of the equation. The uh, you know what I've been told that when I don the uh, the tennis ball shirt that uh, it's not a bad look for me. I uh, I've got about four of these. I dig the uh, the tennis ball look. I really do. Um, you're right, Miss Dragon says the FDA is run by big pharma and vice versa. If you look at the sad the incestuous relationship when you leave the Sacklers when you stop working for uh, for that company. Well, then you simply go over to the uh, for the Food and Drug Administration. And contrarily wise, if you leave the Food and Drug Administration, head on over. The Sacklers have got a job for you. It leads somebody to wonder whether or not, I don't know, maybe they're, maybe they're just, you know, doing that stuff the whole time the people were wherever. You feel me? Funny thing happened. I've talked about it many times on the boat. Many times on the boat. But they went up to Congress and said, hey, man. This Oxycontin stuff that we made, it's dangerous. We made a mistake. Uh, the way more people are abusing this than we thought. Like there's a bunch of people abusing this. There's a bunch of people getting addicted. There are a bunch of people who are overdosing. And I'm telling you, we sat back and thought to ourselves, hey, these guys aren't so bad. They're copping to the fact that their product isn't safe. They're, they're, they're almost acting stand-up. No, you know what they were doing? The ultimate power play. They were going in front of Congress and saying, this isn't safe. In three months, the whole world's going to get to manufacture it as a generic. We don't think that should be allowed. It's way too dangerous to let the whole world manufacture this. We need to reformulate it. It bought them a huge new block of time that no one else could compete with them until they fixed. None of this was a mistake. They knew they knew that they were going to do that before they sold the first pill. They knew they were going to roll this puppy out that crap loads of people were going to get addicted to it. They knew they were going to have a bunch of overdose deaths. And you know what? That was okay. That was okay. And they played it perfect, didn't they? Because the United States of America is going to fine them $7 billion with a B, right? $7 billion. You guys do know how much money that is, right? That's $7,000 million. So if you had a million dollar bill, 7,000 of them, right? Eee, $7 billion. You think to yourself, now that's a fine, right? Yeah. Come for your daughters, Chuck. They're going to keep seven. See, there's the rub. They made 13 billion in the process of killing 900,000 people with their drug. And they're going to get to keep um, six billion of it. Well, that's, a, that's good work if you can get it. Seriously, they've killed more people than cancer, at least recently, right? Sparked the biggest drug uh, epidemic we've ever had. And they're going to get to parachute out with half of the money they made in the process of destroying our country. You got to tip your hat to pimping, right? That is a, that is a mean group of people. I don't care what show they got like uh, Walter White. I'm sorry. Walter White's a punk. The Sacklers, those are cold hearted people, right? For real. Ted Bundy soft. The Sacklers, they were killers, stone cold killers. The number of people they took out, forget about it. There is nobody on earth that's killed more people than the Sacklers. Currently, seriously, who out there? Wow. And what did you get for your efforts? Well, $6 billion. 
did not kill a million people. Don't make a big deal. It was only like 900,000 or something. Uh, bad people, man. And from Massachusetts, research is your friend. I'll tell you what, if you're in pain or if you're having problems, I understand wanting to deep dive to do everything you can to try to treat pain without going down the uh, the big pharma road or whatever. I'm hugely into researching stuff like that. I really am. What I try not to do is diagnose myself because I get, I'm squirrely, man. I got priors. You know what I mean? I can, I know I'm a head case. I know I'm a head case, right? Everybody knows I'm a head case. <laughs> Some more than others. Organic ginger in warm water helps with pain. I think I dated an organic ginger <laughs> in college, just briefly. I don't remember whether or not I ever got her in warm water. Probably. Mary Gonzalez. I don't know if I said hello to you earlier. Allison Metcalf Palumbo, always a pleasure. Correct. Make no mistake. Everything that is on the street today killing people, most of the deaths today are not coming from Big Pharma. Big Pharma has now done the knee jerk reaction that they always do, and in response, are killing these people just as if they were doing it themselves. Here's what they did. They got all of the drugs from the Sacklers, right? They ruled out OxyContin. They told the world, I heard it out of a doctor's mouth personally. She said, Tommy, you got to try to get addicted to this stuff. This is the safest substance that they have ever had for treating pain. This stuff, you got to try to get addicted to this stuff. And I did try to get addicted. I took 12 OxyContin 80s a day. And trust me when I tell you, you'll get addicted. Now, by way of full disclosure, I had a pretty good drug problem when I walked into the pain uh, management clinic. I would be lying to you if I told you otherwise. I had a pretty good drug problem when I went in there. But boy, oh boy, I got a much better drug problem <clears throat> by going through that process, right? Then what happens? The knee-jerk reaction, right? We had pill mills. You could walk in and go, hey, I have menstrual cramps. They'd go uh, 12 Oxycontin 80s a day. Have a nice day. See you later. You could walk in and go, I have migraines, 12 Oxycontin 80s a day. Good day. See you later. Didn't matter what you went in for. They were, they were doctors writing a thousand scripts a day, right? Even if you're working a 10 hour day, you're writing a hundred scripts an hour. You're 60 minutes in an hour. <laughs> if you saw every patient for a minute, you see a problem here, right? It doesn't add up. doesn't make sense. They had these pill mills all over the U.S. So what do we do? We do the knee-jerk thing. No doctors are handing that poison out ever again. You understand? No more scripts for that. That's over. It's done. It's a wrap. Well, well, where does that army of junkies go? If you think they call up the local dope dealer and say, hey, you got some heroin? No. These are pill addicts. They don't want heroin. They're terrified of that. But there aren't any pills out there. If there were, people are buying them. Now, don't get it messed up. There were dudes faking insurance uh, scams. Uh, there were guys that had doctors or pharmacists on the DL. So there was some street dope. There was some street Oxycontin, but not a lot of them. Not a lot of them. So the cartels ain't stupid. Since it was real hard to get people to switch over to the tar, they said, screw it. Started running the pill presses, right? What pills did everybody like? Well, they liked Perk 30s. Well, good. Let's make them in every color under the rainbow. Right? M30s. All the pills out there killing people are fake Percocet 30s. <sighs> Not an accident. Not an accident. This is all part of what happened with the Sacklers. Now, so now if you actually have pain, you go to a pain specialist, the pain specialist is going to be like, yeah, I can give you Toradol. I can't give any out, out any of that crap because I'm afraid they'll put me in prison if I treat people's pain. For real, right? These are knee-jerk reactions. It always goes one way or the other, back and forth. Instead of just taking it down the middle and, and saying, hey, maybe saying that, that nobody gets any dope is the wrong idea. And maybe saying everybody, if you're six years old and you stubbed your toe, let's give you some dope. Maybe it's not all the way right or all the way left. Ah. 
maybe the happy medium is where we ought to be looking. Adderall is absolutely more of a head addiction than a physical addiction. However, uh, if you do Adderall for a long, a long enough period of time, the reason that you end up with physical symptoms is because you're depleting your body's stash of feel-good chemicals, dopamine, oxytocin, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the chemicals in your brain get released in a cocktail when you do meth. Right, and Adderall is just meth in a pill. You call it whatever you want. Look up, look up the chemical name for it. <laughs> you know, it's just meth in a pill. It really is. Right, you got Ritalin, uh, Adderall. The next one is Dexedrine, right, or De Dexies. That's dextromethamphetamine, and then Dizoxin is just methamphetamine. It's literally what the, but it's all just meth. Lynn says, I was doing 60 milligrams of Adderall for two years. Okay, so what what you're really, the, the buzz that you kind of feel on it is your brain chemicals releasing your own, that's that's what's happening, right? You deplete that, right? You deplete that. If you're taking, if you're taking it every single day, you, you start to deplete those stores. And unfortunately, your body gets to a point where it says, I'm not going to release any of the feel-good chemicals unless they give you some of that Adderall, right? And... Over a long enough period of time, people uh, develop what is called anhedonia, and it's the inability to feel because pharmaceutical crack, says uh, STFU Darcy. Lynn Sanity says prescribed, to which, with all due respect, I would say, well, of course it's prescribed, right? Let's be real honest, folks. And I'm not saying, by the way, Lynn, you might, uh, you might be doing everything right, but I'll tell you something. It's not a hard drug to get a script for in the United States of America, right? I promise you, it's uh, it's a very popular drug in the U.S. It is insanely popular. It's probably, um, yeah, I'd say it's one of the most popular drugs in the world. A lot of people are abusing it. And they think it is a miracle pill. They think it's that uh, crap from that movie. Got a lot of, um, yeah, it, it, it sucks for a bit. Um where is that? It sucks for a bit, but it will go away. Yeah, ASAP, you're exactly right. It's going to suck for a little bit. Benzos equals anodotian time. Brazy, damn straight. Damn straight. ASAP says they can't keep up making it. She's talking about uh, Limitless is the name of the movie. Thank you very much. Um, you're right. They can't keep up with the supply and the demand for Adderall. And the reason is, well, I don't know. Maybe every single college freshman in the United States of America having a script for it is causing problems, right? Every freshman, every sophomore, every junior, and every senior, right, all are have a script for Adderall. And a lot of the people that graduate are taking it too. A lot of truth to this. A lot of truth to this. He says... It's because of free will and corrupt government and pharmaceutical companies. We were also conditioned here to take drug, to take a drug rather, to fix everything and dull pain and reality. Well, I mean, we really have been, haven't we? Right? We have been. I want you to think of every single movie, man. Think of a movie that you have watched, right? The, the protagonist, the guy, he gets bummed out, right? He's fighting with the girl, whatever. What does he do? He goes to a bar, right? He starts drinking. It's part of every single film, right? Oh, no, I'm bummed out. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to get loaded. I mean, but before I was 12 or 13 years old, I knew that, you know, if you got in a fight with your girlfriend, you went to a bar. <laughs> it was just part of every single movie you ever watched. I remember being of age, and the first time I got into an argument, thinking I'm old enough to go to a bar and drink. Like, that's what you're supposed to do. Honestly, as silly as it is. I had no idea back in the day how strong Adderall was. So the first time I did it, I snorted like five pills. I'm sorry. What? Oh, that was probably three or four days you enjoyed. Uh, didn't sleep for two days, but my house was clean as heck. I don't eat. I don't sleep. But I got the cleanest house on the street. Crystal meth. Really funny commercial. I was hoping Johnny Scoville heard that, but he didn't. Uh, it was a commercial from the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Showed a person on the ground 
with a toothbrush, given the uh, <laughs> given the grout, the business. And the, the song, I don't eat, I don't sleep, but I got the cleanest house on the streets. Crystal meth. You're not, you don't come across as you're judging anybody, uh, doll. I think you're in pretty good shape on that, right? We, we know who you are. Um, but on top of it, this is legit. Look, I'm the same dude. First of all, put a pile of, of uh, Adderall in front of me. I could eat it for four days, five days, and quit and never want to do it again. It's not, I never held any appeal whatsoever, right? But I know for me, that there is a list of medications, a laundry list of medications I can't take because I know what it does to me in the body and I know what it does to me in the mind. And I know that I'll be on the next train smoking to uh, to Mexico to go buy black tar because that's, you know, if you know that that's not you, Sunshine, you got nothing to apologize for and don't take it. You're right. Brazy, thank you so much. Five more people just turned green. And you know what? It is better to be green. Ingest Adderall, it lasts longer, says ASAP. And you know what? You're right. The uh, people that snort that stuff, it's going to hit you a lot quicker. It's also going to go away a lot quicker. Those drugs were actually made uh, to ingest for a reason. You understand? The uh, They were uh, meant to ingest for um, a uh, a reason. Z-Dub, good to see you, my friend. Miss Dragon says, I don't need meth to break out the toothbrush. <laughs> Just piss me off and I'll micro clean. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, no. M-I-L. M-I-L. I don't know what M-I-L stands for. But my mill uh, firmly believes in the magic pill. She hasn't found it yet, but she believes it's out there. Well, I believed heroin was the magic pill for a really long time. And it was until it wasn't. I mean, it did everything I wanted it to do until it wasn't. Henny, great comment. And he says, alcohol is supposed to uh, epitomize strength and machismo in movies. Yeah, unfortunately. It's stupid, isn't it? But do you know what? It's something that we continue to do. Oh, I got you. Mother-in-law. Mother-in-law. Great song. Say should be her name. Mother-in-law. Mother-in-law. To me, they're just the same. Mother-in-law. Mother-in-law. Do, 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 do. Magic for what? Uh, people who believe that for many of us, we feel uncomfortable in our own skin, right? That's one of the reasons that some addicts are addicts. They feel incredibly uncomfortable in their own skin. So they sit around and when they have idle hands on the time or whatever, they start feeling anxious or freaking out or whatever, right? You get that, that feeling that you just cannot control. And uh, as addicts, people that self-medicate, we're usually looking for the pill that's going to make that feeling go away. We're looking for the pill that's going to allow us to, to the magic pill makes you feel social with uh, with society, right? So you can go out and never feel like, oh, I don't know like how I look or I don't feel, you just, you're Mr. or Mrs. Confidence, right? You know you got it. It's, right, it's everything. You're You're there. It's like cocaine, but cocaine just makes you think that and you're really an idiot. But the, the people that are looking for the perfect pill, they want to be social, right? They don't want to hang over. They want all the great aspects of drugs. Drugs make people, right, feel like they're more socially, uh, you know, they have no fear. It takes away all of this, all of the good of drugs, none of the bad. That's the theory of that perfect pill. Doesn't exist. Promise. I've tried them all. Another Quailu. Show along me in the morning. Yeah, that's a rugged scene. Chasing the dragon. It's funny you say that. Uh, that's, a, that's a term we were pretty fond of back in the day. 
I was sick recently and was really looking forward to a shot of NyQuil. Apparently there is a god. All I had on hand was DayQuil. Uh, <laughs> I hope your dad made it though. Um, yes, it's probably good that, uh, that you had the DayQuil. I need a car. It says, I know I drink way too much wine. I need to remedy. It's what helps me uh, sleep. But at this point, it's what it takes uh, for me to get any rest. I hate it. You know, you're not alone. Has anyone ever tried quaaludes? Oh, my God, yes. I've done uh, mountains of them. And if I had to go out on a limb, I would say Monk has. I would say Braz Brazzy Girl has. I would say Miss Dragon has. I'd say Henny has. I bet I'm pretty close on most of those. You got to be of a certain age because they disappeared. Um, half a bottle of Goldschlager. Oh, Lord Allison, Metcalf, Palumbo. Have I ever told you guys my Goldschlager story? Um, I, uh, I fired a bartender that they paid to work a guy's party. He was having a birthday party and they had hired a bartender. And um, I uh, I fired the uh, I fired the bartender. I don't know what my problem was. I had been eating a lot of Rehypnol that night. The, uh, the roofies. I had roofied myself. And uh, I fired the, uh, the bartender. And I wasn't really any good at being a bartender. I couldn't mix drinks. But we had like eight or nine bottles of Goldschlager on ice back there. And people would come up and say, hey, I want a Long Island iced tea. And I'd go, hey, I don't know how to make one. Uh, but I can give you a Goldschlager. And that's, uh, I just poured out Goldschlager shots all night. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people vomit on that. It's, uh, if you've never had it, it has little flakes of gold floating in it, right? Um, which is a great little selling point. It's always nice to see gold suspended in, uh, in cinnamon. It's a very, very, very heavy cinnamon flavor. I would imagine that um, Ms. Palumbo um, is probably... Uh, Miss Metcalf Palumbo was probably not a huge fan anymore of uh, of that beverage, and for that matter, maybe not um, a lot of uh, cinnamon, fake cinnamon stuff in general. Probably makes you unhappy. That would be my guess. Second all, two and all, born again Buddhist says two and all, and then it says second. But I think they were going for second all. I could be wrong, but I think that's what they were going for because. Second all, for those back in the day, second all and two and all were kind of like, a, they were in the same family as Quaaludes, actually. They were all barbiturates, good barbs back in the day. They don't make them anymore. Tommy, when I drank Gold Schlager, I was the life of the party. But half a bottle of it behind a greasy cheeseburger, that did it. People say I'm the life of the party because I tell a joke or two. Yes! So will her poop, says a uh, seventh. I'm assuming he's referring to the gold fleck. Um, and that could be the case. Donna says, I never liked quaaludes. Can't sleep on my own, but speed I enjoyed. Nothing too strong, just enough to keep me up for a day or two. Okay, I get that. There were people that, uh, you know, I, uh, I did speed so that I could do uh, more opiates. Can't do any liquid cinnamon. I knew that one was coming, Ms. Metcalf Palumbo. I knew that was coming. Don't like alcohol, but I'm addicted to weed. Okay. Now, are you wanting to get off weed, or is this something you're cool with? Huh? Is that Hilda? Am I saying that? I got to blow it up. Blow it up, blow it in. Yeah, Hilda. Hilda. Um, that was Johnny Scoville's uh, big love. Like he 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 had an alcohol addiction, but Johnny was a pothead, man. That was his uh, that was his drug. I smoked pot every day for a couple of decades, you know. But I haven't smoked it, and uh, it's not it's not my thing anymore. But um, you go back and forth on it. Here's the deal: stick around, listen to uh, to all the stuff that we talk about. We don't pressure anybody to quit anything here. We're kind of a different kind of a uh, different kind of a sobriety channel. In fact, we're not a sobriety channel, <laughs> but we. Uh, we're a support group for people who want to get sober and we don't, Hey, smoke. Good to see it. And we don't bust anybody's chops. Hilda for if we're anti-addiction, if your weed habit is starting to, uh, to cause your quality of life to go in the wrong direction, then you need to start looking at it. Right. So, I mean, honestly, it's weed. So 
it's probably not a massive thing with money, right? Because weed doesn't take up a ton of cash. Most people can, can maintain a weed habit for a pretty small amount of money. The question becomes in my mind, and this has got to be something you answer. And, and even, even whether or not you would ask yourself this, this question is really up to you in the first place. But here's how I do it. Uh, like I, I, I drink beer. I, I may do it 10 times a year, right? But I will have beer. It's not, it's not a, a, a thing in my life, right? If, however, I start to have a beer every time I'm a little bummed out, or if I start having a beer because it's been a tough day and it becomes part of a coping mechanism for me, then I assure you, it's just a matter of time before I'm putting a needle in my arm. Because if I use anything as a coping mechanism, this unit is going to go, bro, there's only one coping mechanism, right? We did it for 30 years. Get that crap back here. Go get me a, uh, a bag of U100 insulin syringes and let's do this, right? I was a heroin addict for a really long time and I cannot do anything in my life that I use as a coping mechanism. I have to cope with things on my own. Yeah, I use it to cope. Okay, Hilda, I appreciate the crap out of your honesty, right? Um, a lot of times people don't want to uh, to admit that stuff. Mary Gonzalez, you know what? I'm glad that you said this because people don't seem to say this very often. But the truth is I've heard a lot of people say this, right? That weed completely gutted me emotionally and it killed my motivation. The motivation thing I hear a lot. But I've heard other people say that it really gutted them emotionally. And I wish uh, I wish the people that felt that way would speak up because we hear a lot about the benefits of weed. We don't hear a lot of people who talk about the negatives, but they're out there because I'm working with a bunch of people that really struggle with this. Debbie P says, I never had a Quaalude. Couldn't get them because they were banned here and or they stopped making them. The only place you can still get a Quaalude that I am aware of um, is South Africa. But they don't call them quaaludes. They call them mandrax. Same drug, though. Trust me, I did a bunch of mandrax. The goblin says, if you want a beer, it, uh, it is okay. If you need a beer, there's a problem. Yeah, that's probably a really great way to put it, you know. Every once in a while, uh, I go and I, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Corona, and I'll have one. But uh, it's what's, what you will never see is me have four, right? In fact, it is a rare occasion that you would see me have three. I'm usually two, and that's that's it. I'm sure most of you know I have an affinity for ganja. I've done many things and have given them all up, but not my weed. ASAP, I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at you. And here's the thing. If you are using weed, right? If you are using weed for your coping mechanism, I'm still not mad at you. Follow me? It's just not for me, right? If this is what we usually say around here, if you're gonna uh, if you're gonna continue to uh, to use, we hope that you'll stick around, right? And that you'll watch what we're we're doing, and you know, until you decide that you're going to quit, then then we'll love you and, uh, and support you as much as we can. And then if you decide you're going to quit, we'll do the exact same thing. It it shouldn't change one way or the other. Cindy Collins, good to see you. The weed of 30 years ago does not compare to the weed today. Fact. Fact. They are as far apart as one another as two, uh, as, as you could be and still be called the same drug, right? We're talking about, honestly, um, the THC levels. You know, I think when the, the, the THC, when I was in high school, they used to talk about 9 and 10% being, you know, about average, Um you know, now you see stuff that's in the, the 40s and, you know, maybe higher. And, and that's just, that's actual flower. You know, they got extracts and things that that have, you know, levels of, uh, of you know, THC that you, you can't even wrap your brain around. But, um, and hey, by way of full disclosure, I am about 45 minutes away from uh, eating a, uh, um, a weed gummy, a THC gummy that I eat every single night to go to sleep. Um, I'll tell you what though, I don't like the feeling I, uh, of the, uh, of the edible. Uh, I think I've told the, the story on the boat, but I had a, uh, I had a migraine and I took the, uh, I took the gummy and the migraine kept me from being able to get to sleep, but the gummy still kicked in and I didn't have a good time. Um, I didn't really, 
Lynn, Lynn Sandy says, I have a weed pen that's 90% good God, man. Good God, man. I didn't even know that that was possible. You know what? Interesting. Very interesting. Diane Hill says, I don't even like uh, driving the streets here in California because of the uh, people using weed. I want to tell you something. Uh, I've done a lot of dope, right? I've done everything you can do. I really have. Mm -hmm. And there are people who will tell you, you'll hear a lot of them, people that are going to say, um, there's no chance whatsoever that weed, you know, impairs my ability to drive a car. BS. I promise you it does. I promise you it does. What it is really good at is making you believe that you're not at all impaired. Alcohol, you usually know you are. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah, I got a buzz, but I can still do it. Read, you're like, oh, this doesn't affect my, uh, it really does affect people's driving. Yeah, I would, you have every right to be a little bit uh, bummed out about that. Hey, uh, Ray Ray, you know, it's a, Ray Ray makes a pretty good point. First of all, thoughts and prayers for your, uh, for you and your brother. And I'm sorry that, uh, that, you know, you're having a tough time, but, um, having a hobby, the peppers, having something that you're doing on the side is a massive thing. I'm telling you, it is a massive thing. If it weren't for, uh, for watches and things that I do with watches, I would go insane. I would absolutely go insane. By the way, by the way. If I sent you an email, go check all of your emails. If you ever asked me for any watch info, I sent out everybody. There's nobody that I owe an email on watches to. Go check and see if I've sent you one because I'm going and seeing a, a purchasing agent the uh, either tomorrow or the following day. And I don't want to sell any watches that I have. A bunch of you had asked for some prices on things and everybody has gotten it. So check your emails because I'm about to sell a bunch. Uh, Anita Card says, I can't stand weed. It makes me super paranoid. It makes time go too slow. It's a horrible feeling for me. It amazes me how people can function on it. You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, I smoked, the last time I smoked, I smoked in prison and I got, well, I mean, prison's, you know, kind of an environment that'll make you paranoid anyway. But I smoked, um, what do they call that crap? Dabs, that little waxy looking stuff. Look like green, uh, almost like green hash. And uh, uh, the the size of the ball of this stuff that I smoked was so small that if I took the readers off, I wouldn't have been able to see it. I'm not being funny. And uh, I did a little toilet paper roll and some uh, and some tin foil. And I remember looking at the kid that I did it with. He was like Spanky's age, and I said, "I'm having a horrible time, man. Like I am having a." horrible time. This is way too strong. I'm not having any fun whatsoever. And then each time the cop would walk by to do his rounds, I would look at him and this is what I would say. Right? <laughs> like he, he was he was staring at me. I was 100% sure of it. And yeah, I had a terrible time. It was it was absolutely awful. Your mom lived on a sailboat for over 15 years. I hated it. And the hummingbird, what kind of sailboat did your mom live on just for laughs? Um my uh, my brother Johnny and I spent a little time on a on a sailboat. Made my own edibles. Was the uh, bus uh, was on the bus for six hours. Horrible uh, show. Oh no, man! Six hours of edibles. Damn. Your first dabs experience was like that too. Paranoia. Yeah, it's a, it was a it was a super strong drug, and, I, and doing it in prison first of all was uh, was awful. Vixen, good to see you. Sixty-seven foot, three large sails. You know what, Ann Hummingbird? Sixty-seven foot. That is a boat. We were on a little Hunter thirty-six or something. Thirty, uh, thirty-four, thirty-six. A little little Hunter. You know, that's a big sixty-seven. Is a big boat. That's a house. You know what, Lynn Sanity? Thank you for not suffering in silence. Good for you. And listen, this is a process, sunshine, right? <clears throat> Just know that. And no, it's not all or nothing. It's not the end of the world. Don't make it into it because a lot of people do. And then they build this up into something so massive that if there's a stumble, well, then I'm too embarrassed to look at these people ever again. So I'm going to take off and go away and not talk to people. 
if you go, here's the deal. I'm going to get there, right? This is the finish line. I'm going to get there. It doesn't really matter, right? All the crap that goes on. If you keep your eye on the prize and you say the finish line is what? What's the goal in this thing? The goal, Lynn, is you would like to be chemical free off of this stuff, right? Well, I believe that you could do that. But the other day, right, got a, an email from somebody that said, I'm, I'm devastated. You know, 14, I had 14 months of sobriety and I, I got loaded the other day and blah, blah, blah. One day, right? And he, he said, I blew everything, not all of that sobriety. It's all down the toilet. Why in hell is it all down the toilet? I'm lost. I'm lost. How in hell is it all down the toilet? You mean suddenly you got loaded all of those days? Because if you got 14 months of clean in and you got one day of getting loaded, you need to add up the 14 months, right? Those days. So 30 months, give or take, multiplied by 14. And then take that one extra day, put it in there, divide it by two. Right? That's a hell of a lot of sober. It means you use twice in 14 months. That's what you focus on. But too often we have this all or friggin' nothing mentality, right? And then we start to get excited about the prospect of being a better person. And you start getting excited about the people who are around you. But when you stumble, you go, I can't face those people, right? They're all success stories. No, they're all drug addicts. We stumble too. Go back and watch. You'll, you can watch me stumble. I'm no better than anybody here. No better than anybody here, right? Nobody is. We fight a disease. Got news for you. The disease is insidious. It doesn't like you. Your brain doesn't like you. It wants you to fail. Eh, wants you to fail. So we need all the friggin' help we can get. And more importantly, we sure don't need anybody busting our chops. So if you feel like you stumble or whatever, well, get your butt back here, <laughs> right? Get your butt back here. Yeah, I'll tell you something. I'm a, I'm a drug addict with a really good seat. That's what I am, to be really honest. This right here, I got a great seat to a really, really good show. Um, Let's see what Zdev said. Uh, my friend is in AA. I guess her sponsor slipped and had a sip of beer at her ex-husband's funeral. She was supposed to have her 10-year chip and anniversary the other day. They ended up canceling. Over a sip of beer, did they? Well, I mean, you know what? I think that's just that's just stellar, isn't it, Z-Dub? You know what they're going to do? They're going to build this up so big that, I mean, if you take away, right, that, all of that time, 10 years. So now you got what a day? Well, well, the day's not worth protecting, is it? I mean, hell, you had 10 years. That was your that was your beautiful prize, right? That was your gold watch. That was your beautiful prize. With that gone, what what streak am I protecting? I got one day under my belt. I can get loaded again today. For real. I can get loaded today. What difference does it make? I only got one day in. I'll get loaded two days and then I'll get sober the next day. And then people go, you know what? I can get loaded this week. I mean, I already blew the 10 years. BS, man. You've gotten loaded once in 10 years. Get your ass back up on the wagon, right? Get it back under control. Sorry. But that whole, that whole mentality, your sobriety started two days ago, Lynn Sanity. Your sobriety date started two days ago. No matter what happens, if you're, if you're, focus never gets off the prize, then I don't care whether or not you stumble. Sip a beer at a wedding? Who gives a crap? If it was two shots, if it was six cocktails, but the person gets up the next day and went, what the hell did I do? Uh, what you did is you better shake it off and get right back up on the, uh, there you go. Perfect example. It's like a preacher who said, right? One sin. And you're going to hell. It's the same. You're almost five years off alcohol. Where's the Molesky trophy when I need it? I'm in the wrong room, but that is worth the Molesky. I promise you it is. I promise you it is. But there is a there is a prevailing wind in, I hate to call it an industry and call it a community or whatever you want to call it. But in this, there's an all or nothing mentality in sobriety, 
right? Like I, I can't have you pot smokers in here because um, there's there's people in here that, you know, what we're working with. It's uh, I think we're a little different, man. I think we're a little different. I don't give a crap if somebody's smoking weed. I really don't. It doesn't seem to me, right? Yeah, Lynn Sanity, that's massive, girl. That's massive. So you know the drill. You know what now rinse and repeat, right? Zen Wen, did it bother you? Did it break your heart for your friend? I think I'd be on the phone going, please don't trivialize. Don't don't flush your 10 years down the toilet over a sip. That's just stupid. You know what? I'm going to go out on a limb and say that everybody here loves you too. Tell you what, we see ones all the time. How about throwing up the tray? Can we get a three? It says, uh, I love you, uh, Lynn Sanity there. huh? That, that three is for you, Lynn. Five years is amazing. It really is. Hey, Squirrel Squad Luann, what's happening? Pleasure to see you. And we love the Squirrel Squad. In fact, oh, you know, I, I kind of almost hate to disturb her because she has got the just happy, happy, happy cat look on her face. Look at that kitty. Oh. She's a little lion, you know. That kitty shares like 98% DNA with the uh, with the lion. Do you know that? It's a true story. The house cat shares so much DNA with the uh, the big kitties. I love that. I love that. You got a lot of threes there, girl. You got a lot of threes there. Feels good, doesn't it? Squirrel is a star. Lynn Sanity, so are you. Uh, I hope you're as proud of you as we all are. Because that's a big damn deal, man. That really is. That's a big damn deal. That's a lifetime, girl. That's a lifetime. Now rinse and repeat. We're going to do the same thing with weed. And it isn't the end of the, uh, it's the, it's the start of the journey. And you know what happens when we get that weed completely out of your system? You know what happens when we get to that point where everything is gone, right? Boy, I'm telling you, Miss Dragon, I think I share more than 99. But when you get all of those things and you can get them in the rearview mirror and they're behind you, that's what we call base camp, right? That's where you get to the bottom of Everest and you can look up and go, yeah, right? Or maybe it ain't an Everest. Maybe it's a beach. But whatever it is, that's where you get to the point where you're like, okay, right? I got 46 years old. I'll tell you something. 46 years old is a very interesting time to go, I'm going to start my life today. But that's what I did. And I promise you, you can do it at any age. I promise you, you can do it at any age. But I did it at 46. And I had to learn coping skills and coping mechanisms and all of these things. Uh, Zen Wen says, I'm all about harm reduction too. I told my friend, I hope she doesn't throw me out if I accidentally slip and use one time again and then get sober again. No, you know what? And and it's it's worth communicating. It really is. Tim and B-Man says, I'm starting at 57. I love it. Yeah, but you look like you're 39 and I look like I'm 77. But that's okay. I'm uh, I'm feeling better today than I did yesterday. I think that that's probably, uh, that's probably the best that we can hope for, yeah? As of yesterday, I have four years and two months. I won't let anybody shame me if I slip and I'm honest about it. And then I start over. At least I still have that four years and two months. Yeah, you never give that up. And I want to tell you something. Um, I love, I love the fact that there are people who will listen to that comment and go, oh, she's already planning for failure. That's an, no, she's planning for success. Feel me? She's planning for success. You, you plan for every contingency. Idiots will spend more time planning a fishing trip than they will the sobriety that's supposed to last them the rest of their life, Right? but it's not something that you can do without planning. So I would have that. I would have that from day one in my head that God forbid, God forbid something happens and you stumble a little bit or whatever. God forbid there's that stumble. 
I'm, I'm not going to let that drown me down. And I'm not going to let anybody shame me or anything else. My disease has s- symptoms. Yeah. My disease has symptoms. I'm going to do everything I can to keep those symptoms at bay for the rest of my life. I work really hard for that. I do. I work really hard to stay sober. I don't, I'm not a passive, right? So sober is a verb. And, and I'm not a dude that, that sits around to stay sober. I work my ass off to stay sober. I really do. I work hard at this, you know? So I sure as crap, I'm never going to let anybody shame me if, uh, if I stumble. That's uh yeah, I uh, thank you, Shannon Smith. I uh, I do feel a little better, you know. Most of me does. I'm I'm <laughs> stay up later, Captain. Enjoying tonight. Hey, you know what? I'm I'm, I'm later than I normally go. Right? I'm uh, I'm later than I normally go. Uh, I do plan, you know, and it's the right thing to do. You plan for every contingency. You know, I recommend I recommend this in everything right? In everything. Talk to your partner, right? Talk to your mate. You know how great uh, a society, how much better we would do if people sat down like before you got married and said, all right, here's the deal. Not going to be any talk of divorce ever. We're not using the D word. We're not. D word doesn't get mentioned. However, if you cheat, right, then that's it. It's over. But take that off the table with the divorce, there ain't going to be any cheating and there ain't going to be any divorce. And if you can take those things and say those two are off the table, well, then nothing can't be overcome, right? But people don't do that. They don't take the time to even communicate. And you're not going to get very far if you don't. If I ever do it again, if I ever have the opportunity to do it again, and, and who knows, right? I'm, uh, honestly, from... Uh, from husband material, I don't have a great resume, <laughs> you know, but if I were to ever do it again, if I ever go down that road, um, my uh, significant other and I are going to sit down and we're going to talk about communication. I mean, we're going to spend weeks talking about communication. We're going to spend weeks talking about what, how we're going to fight, how we're going to argue, right? For real. Uh, fall seven times, get up eight. I love it. Right. Don't let, don't let, uh, don't be defined by the number of times you fall down, right? Be defined by the number of times you get up. It's really, really a solid piece of advice. Shannon Smith, uh, right. from your, uh, from your lips to God's ears, right? If we knew then what we know now, huh? Oh Lord. That is solid. Uh, yeah. I want to wash that gray right out of my hair. Do-do-do. Yeah, here you go. See this? Great. Communicate it. Muhammad Ali said, it's not whether you get knocked down. It's about how you get up. You know, he was a friend of mine. He really was. I, uh, I got to know Muhammad Ali. So, or a uh, an amazing opportunity in my life that uh, you know I did a lot of I did a lot of sleazy and disgusting things and uh, if you know for business as a way to make money and one of them happened to actually you know do some some pretty some pretty kind and philanthropic stuff was it a hustle you betcha everything I did was a hustle mm-hmm. but we did some philanthropic stuff and we helped some people and, uh, and mom and Ali was there, you know, we got to meet him and work with him, which was really, really cool. All right, people, we are getting, uh, I am getting on to, uh, to that time of the, uh, of the day. Uh, you imagine I was a fabulous wife. Why? Thank you. I, I thought I did. All right. You know, Oh wait, no, you're not talking to me. Um, Valerie, I believe that. Take a letter, Maria. Time flies on the lifeboat. Boy, you're not playing. eh? The time does fly on this boat. Plant Freak, you got this. You got this. All right, people. 
with that, I am out of here. I'm going to show you this pushy cat. She has, she heard a rumble. I think it might have been thunder, right? She doesn't like thunder. So she did, she went from happy cat to, she's in loaf mode. What a good kitty though, huh? What a good kitty. She loves a snout rub. She loves a good snout rub. Hey, Goblin, that makes me feel great. You know that? It really does. I, uh, you do 2,000 hours of this, right? Hello, Asta. I've done literally 2,000 plus hours of this. Jason P., thank you, my brother. I'm going to take this thing, and we run with it in a bunch of different directions. I've gotten a bunch of emails about people who said that, um, you know, the new format this and the new format, there ain't a new format, people. There's not, right? The lifeboat is the lifeboat. The lifeboat's always going to do what the lifeboat does, you know? But we, uh, we chase things sometimes because the stories need to be told, right? And I want to tell you something. I don't see anybody telling the Diddy story the way I'm telling it. I wish that they were, but I don't see anybody telling the story the way that I'm telling it. I didn't see anybody telling the masses and story the way I told it. They started to by the end, to be sure, but they didn't in the beginning. And when people don't tell a story the way that I tell it, then I feel like I got to friggin' tell it. And I didn't, no one's done the Nickelodeon story a whole lot of justice. I, I think that, I don't know. I think if you get people uh, fired up enough that, you know, maybe guys like, uh, like Dan Schneider will do a little time. Because it's going to be people like us getting politicians riled up. Politicians get pissed off when things happen because they don't want to lose their fiefdom. Right? Our powers and our numbers. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to talk about stuff like that. Yeah, I'm going to. And uh, and I'm going to do things to, uh, to try to keep my head in the game. Because I want to promise you something, people. To do this thing and to do uh, 2,000 hours of it in a couple of years and to talk to a bunch of people who, uh, who are trying to stay sober, right? Um, dozens of whom haven't made it. Well, every once in a while, I'm going to do some crap to put a smile on my face. So if you're bummed out about um, the, uh, the, the curriculum or the agenda or the, uh, the direction, you know, with all due respect, sit back down. I started this channel for one reason, and I'm not trying to break anybody's heart, but it wasn't to help anybody get sober. It was to get Q out of prison. For real. I am of the firm belief that if I build this thing big enough, I'm going to get my friend out. I think that is my angle. And it's the reason that I get up and I do this. So sometimes when it grinds down on me or I feel like I'm, you know, things that, that keep me smiling or laughing, probably going to roll with it. I love y'all in a really big way. Um, Henny, have a lovely evening, please. Midnight show. Thank you. By the way, um, Q has, uh, it, Q sounds like uh, me at this point with, uh, uh, with our journals. Um, every single time I uh, talk to Q and I talk to Q like this, but every single time I talk to Q, he says, Hey man, the next time we do this, I'm going to talk to you. I want you to hear me. And uh, it's like, I, I'm, I, we really are working on these journals. Calhoun's doing this around the clock and getting stuff done on this. It's really, but it's the same thing. Uh, you know, I know he wants to, uh, to talk to me. And then when it gets right to the end of it, he's just not ready. But the fact that he's hinting, hey, just Pauline, good to see you. The fact that he is, Talking about that is a really good sign. It's a really good thing. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, this Q on mail, Q is in a communication management unit. So it's very difficult for Q. The, the, the short answer is no, honestly. Um, we, in the very beginning, I had about six people that wrote to him and uh, Q is um, myopic. His focus is uh, lasered and... Uh, but the day is coming. I promise people, the day is coming where I'm going to go. I need your help. Thank you, uh, Brazy. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you um, for the commissary. Um, 
thank you. It, uh, I will uh, I will pass that along and get a kick out of it. Uh, tell them zoo zoos and wham whams. Uh, also, by the way, you want to hear something that uh, that I found kind of funny? Uh, his he has uh, atrial fibrillation, which is what uh, caused. It's not what I have, but it's very similar to what I have. So, and he's a little bit younger than I am, but and definitely in better shape. Um, you can let me uh, let me talk to his mom, Miss Dragon. That's a very interesting question. Uh, you know what? It would be, yeah, that's an interesting question, Mindy. You could pop your head up and save a lot of time. I know you're watching. She'd never done that. <laughs> she did call into the show though um, once. You have AFib and flutter. Wow. My goodness, Shannon Smith, are you, oh my goodness, that's a frightening concept to me. I'm still wrapping my brain around the flutter. Um, hey, Wilfred, he says, fast harpy. Yeah, that's what happened to me. My mind will kick down into high gear, and then I can't get it to, to slow down. But, but I've got more than an entire month without any flare-up, but I lost a crap load of weight. And I'm doing a lot to get myself in shape. Um, a lot. You had ablation and it worked. Oh, Shannon Smith, I'm so glad to hear that. I really am. I'm scared to hell of it. And I know it goes perfect for almost everybody. I just, we happen to know somebody, a doctor, who screwed up and took somebody out while doing it. And we knew the guy that he took that took out. We knew the doctor and we knew the, the patient. It was a screwed up, terrible thing. Uh, what time is the eclipse starting? Tomorrow. My understanding is that tomorrow... The eclipse will be starting at 11, simply above your house, though, uh, Jeremy Shaw. I'd get myself a, uh, a Mackinac and uh, sit out there and enjoy. <laughs> Hashtag we love cues, mama too. There you go. Love, love cues, mom as well. Um, your, your attention span is uh, measured in nanoseconds. Yeah. Super ventricular tachycardia and mitral valve regurgitation. Um, I know the uh, the, the uh, valve regurgitation thing, where just that little bit gets sucked back in at the end, and they're afraid that that's going to turn stale and then uh, start clotting. Smoke says, I have a flow murmur. It was always fun getting a Department of Transportation medical card. Yeah, that probably... Uh, Um, yes, prayers for Mama Q, you know, I, she talks to Q every day. Seven says I was on Cricket's channel last night and met a person who has the same wear, uh, disease as I do. NF2 neurofibromatosis type two. What are the odds of that? Honestly, seventh, what are the odds of that? That's downright bizarre. His name was my name, too. And whenever we go out, the people always shout, there goes John Jake Nicholson. Yeah, na, 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 na. Almost up late enough for you to be a dirty stab. What time do you guys kick it off? You don't kick it off till midnight, do you? Tell the truth. What time do you kick it off? Because if... It seems to me, if my memory serves me right, Cricket, you guys are late night. You are the late night. Uh, two and 35,000 of the odds? Nah, that's... So one and 35,000 have it? So the odds are actually way worse than two. And uh, if one in 35,000 has it, then the odds of the two of you meeting are actually considerably higher. I, I took game theory, and I was really terrible and bad at it, but... 1 a.m. Central Time, 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 o'clock my time. 11 o'clock my time? What do you think, I'm a, uh, a college student? Huh? Seriously, well, look like a fraternity man to you? Goodness gracious, I am old and in the way. Oh, yeah, I said it. I'm old and in the way. All right, people. Uh, I love you, all of you, every last one of you. Even you, Jeremy Sheldon. One in 35,000. So you're saying there's a chance. I'm, I'm picking it up. I got you. I got you. Hey, so what was all that one in a million stuff, huh? Yeah. 
Yeah, funny as hell. All right, people, I will see you on the next one. I'm Captain Tommy. Have a great night. Bye-bye.